Hi everyone, I decided to check batteries in my smoke alarm and I noticed an interesting detail in the description. This device contains an emerism 241 or deactive source. I'm wondering why it is there and what should I do with this smoke alarm when it stops working? I can't throw away a radioactive device, can I? Hmm. So let us deal with all these questions. I think all of you have smoke alarms at home. For example, in Estonia it is mandatory to have a smoke alarm in every flat. Based on their operation principles, there exist two basic types of smoke alarms. The first type is photoelectric and the second is ionization type. The first type of smoke alarms detect light scattered by smoke particles and are more advanced devices. In the past, when there were no light emitting diodes and transistor circuits, smoke alarms with radioactive materials were used most frequently. The popular Soviet Read 1 smoke alarm with plutonium 238 based radioactive source falls into this category, and so do most popular ionization smoke alarms with americium 241 radioactive source, which are still on sale. Before explaining to you the operation principle of such radioactive devices, Let's learn about where this element can be found and how it ends up inside such smoke alarms. Just like all elements there are heavier than uranium in the periodic table, americium doesn't occur naturally, and that is why it was created artificially using nuclear synthesis, to be more precise using bombardment of plutonium atoms with datrons accelerated in a particle accelerator called cyclotron. This happened for the first time as a part of the famous Manhattan Project, which dealt with developing certain types of nuclear weapons in the USA. The new element was discovered in 1944 by a team of scientists led by Glenn Seaborg. But because the Manhattan Project was top secret, this information was kept secret and was published only a year after the end of the Second World War. Because the electron shell of the new element resembled that of europium, the new element was named after the continent of which it was discovered, that is, America. Besides being synthesized in laboratories, nowadays americium can be extracted from nuclear fuel waste. One ton of it contains 100 grams of different isotopes of americium. After being reduced and purified, the obtained americium looks like a shiny metal, which quickly oxidizes when exposed to air. Most frequently it exists as an oxide. Also for modern day uses, americium can be obtained in nuclear research reactors using bombardment of plutonium-239 atoms with a stream of neutrons. You might remember from my previous videos that plutonium-239 is used for making nuclear weapons. And during the Cold War, there were tests of nuclear weapons practically all over the world. During such tests, there forms a powerful stream of neutrons, and thanks to it, during the first milliseconds of the explosion, plutonium atom inside a nuclear bomb can turn into americium atoms, which can get scattered by the shock wave for thousands of kilometers. This is why, even 60 years later, there can still be found traces of different americium isotopes as the former nuclear test sites, because half-life of some of those isotopes is over 7000 years. Just like all metals from the actinite series, americium is a radioactive metal. To be more precise, it doesn't have stable isotopes. That is why as time passes, it breaks down into more stable elements. Since this element's core is too big, it strives to lose excess protons and neutrons, transitioning to a more stable state. Usually this happens as a result of a so-called alpha decay. As a result of it, alpha particles, which are cores of helium atoms, fly out of the cores of americium atoms. Since such cores don't have electrons, they can attract them from other elements. The scientific name of this process is ionization. For instance, a helium atom core that flows out of americium can collide with an oxygen molecule from the air and steal its electron, creating oxygen ions in the air. It is this property of americium 
that is used in modern smoke alarms, which allows to measure the spread of smoke by determining the degree of air ionization. In order for you not to get confused, I'd like to illustrate how such smoke alarms work. There is an electric circuit board underneath the device case. There is also such an ionization chamber, which contains a radioactive americium. Also, there are two parallel plates inside the ionization chamber, and they are connected to the power supply. At the same time, every second there fly out lots of alpha particles from the americium source, which constantly collide with oxygen molecules from the air, knocking out their electrons and turning them into ions. Because the upper and lower plates are connected to the power supply, the released ions and electrons get attracted to the lower and upper plates, creating what's known as ionization current, which is registered by the smoke alarm's electric circuit. As soon as smoke particles get into the ionization chamber, they hinder the release of new ions, which weakens the current in the circuit, which gets registered by the alarm's detector and sets off the alarm. That is why such a seemingly simple device has saved thousands of lives, but still, because of the radioactive source inside the device and frequent false alarms, such smoke alarms are gradually getting banned by some countries. I am wondering how high the radiation level is in the ionization chamber of such a device, that it can even ionize the air. To see that, I took that very americium source out of the smoke alarm in a special laboratory and under a fume hood. Never try this at home on your own. The radioactive source itself is just 0.29 micrograms of americium oxide mixed with powdered gold and pressed into an aluminium case. To protect the americium source on top, it is sprayed with a thin layer of gold to prevent spilling of the radioactive oxide and contamination. If I hold the unscapped dosimeter with a mica sensor over the case, at first the radiation level will slightly increase, but if I hold it in immediate proximity to the alpha source, then the readings will be shockingly high. That's because my dosimeter can also detect alpha radiation, although it is not exactly designed to detect it. That is why this measurement is a rough estimate. I also decided to check how well a regular sheet of paper can block alpha radiation emitted by the americium source. I was really surprised, because when it was blocked by the sheet of paper, the radiation level dropped only ever so slightly. For instance, in one of my previous videos, I carried out a similar experiment with a sheet of paper and alpha radiation emitted by plutonium isotope, and during that experiment it worked as intended. I need to find out what's wrong with my americium source. If we look at the diagram of americium 241 decay, which is present in my source, then we will see that at first it emits an alpha particle, and then the likelihood of it emitting a gamma quantum of the energy of about 60 kilo electron volts, with a probability of 36%, and after that it turns into a neptunium atom. Most probably it was this weak gamma radiation that my radio scan dosimeter detected when the source was covered by the sheet of paper and blocked the alpha radiation. If we use another type of dosimeter with a scintillation detector, then we will see a different reading even when the dosimeter is away from the source. Evidently, the cesium iodide crystal inside the device detects mild gamma radiation emitted by americium much better, and at the same time it doesn't detect the stream of alpha particles. By the way, it is not worthy that if we connect this dosimeter to a smartphone, we will be able to see the spectrum of emitted gamma radiation. Indeed, we can see that most radiation doesn't exceed 60 kiloelectron volts, which is completely safe for people, because such radiation doesn't damage our cells and doesn't have a great penetrating power. That is why it is absolutely safe for specialists to work with an americium source in laboratory conditions, unless they swallow it or attach it to their skin with bandage. 
Well, we have seen how dosimeters detect amerism, but alpha radiation emitted by this source can be best seen in a so-called Wilson cloud chamber. To make it, I am using a foamed plastic chamber with dry ice, covered with a regular baking sheet. I put an empty aquarium on top of it, with sponge soaked in ethanol attached to the bottom. When I turn the aquarium upside down, the alcohol vapor starts sinking towards the cold surface of the baking sheet and starts condensing, in time creating such fog. If we put an emerism source inside it, we will see how it starts emitting something resembling rays. These are tracks of alpha particles created from ethanol vapor, which condensed as a result of passing of fast and changed alpha particles through it. It looks very unusual, but because of the powerful stream of alpha radiation emitted by such a source, these tracks were not always visible and were seen only when the chamber was slightly aired out. Evidently, the stream of alpha particles is too powerful and there is not enough alcohol vapor in the chamber to show the effect. It really looks beautiful, and half an hour later there were no more tracks. But that's ok, because there exists another unusual device which allows us to observe powerful streams of alpha radiation. It's called a spark chamber detector, and for some reason these days it's rarely on sale. That is why I decided to make a DIY detector. Basically, the design of this device isn't that complex and hasn't changed since the days of Rutherford. To make it, I used a plank to make a base and several pieces of breadboard. I removed the copper layer from two of them in nitric acid and coated the other two pieces in molten solder. Now I just need to screw it all to the plank and attach a sheet of printed circuit boards to the center, which will serve as a cathode. Now what's left to do is to carefully solder all the thin copper wires parallel to the lower sheet in order to make something like an air condenser. To finish off my setup, I'm soldering a Chinese high voltage multiplier and also an 8 mega ohm resistor in order to prevent burning of the thin wires in case of an electrical breakdown. On connecting in all to the laboratory electrical power supply, I tune the voltage in such a way that this detector is on the brink of an electrical breakdown and that it slightly whistles. Upon bringing the amerism alpha source close, there should be an electrical breakdown and they should form beautiful sparks when alpha particles fly by. However, the wires were either too thin or they were placed too close to the lower plate, but I didn't manage to make my DIY setup that works in a sustainable way. Even substituting the thin wires with thicker wires and stretching them out perfectly didn't really solve the problem. This footage vividly illustrates my emotions after two days of dealing with this detector, but still I didn't give up and decided to pull it all together again and do so more solidly. I found rather precise instructions on how to make a spark chamber detector on the radio code site. There were even diagrams for 3D printing. Eventually I ordered printing of all components and a couple of days later I assembled such a much better looking and most importantly working spark chamber detector. It's time to connect it to the power supply and demonstrate how it works. When an amerism alpha source is placed close to the ZIS air condenser, there happens an electrical breakdown inside it because of the stream of alpha particles and their ionization of the air in between the wires and the lower cathode. In other words, the alpha particles passing through the air make it a more efficient electricity conductor, which in turn creates something like mini lighting bolts. It looks quite interesting.
By the way, such a process also happens in our atmosphere, because most frequently lightning balls strike in storms when cosmic particles pass through the atmosphere, which like alpha particles, increase the electrical conductivity of the air on its path. It's also noteworthy that when a sheet of paper is placed in between the source and detector, we can see that there are no more sparks, and we can see how well a regular paper can block alpha radiation. We have got a rather interesting spark chamber detector, but apparently, because it takes a long time to tune it, and it is not easy to transport it, Nowadays there are few places when you can buy it, only some enthusiasts may have it. But let us answer the last question in this video. How should we dispose of smoke alarms with a radioactive emerism that went out of service? To answer that question I decided to go to an interesting place, which until recently was one of the most top secret places in the world. I set out on a journey to the Estonian city of Paldiski, which is located on a beautiful shore of the Baltic Sea. Since the 1960s, this place was been top secret, because just 3 kilometers away from the city center lies a Soviet training facility with two nuclear reactors for submarines, for training future Soviet submarine sailors. In 1995, this facility was transferred to Estonia, and the two reactors were dismantled and placed in a protective sarcophagus for 50 years until most radioactive elements have decayed. But still it took 10 more years for Estonia to fully decontaminate the territory of the facility and turn it into a currently functioning radioactive waste disposal facility. By the way, the team kindly agreed to give me a tour around the facility. It's clear that it is safe to be inside the old sarcophagus with the reactor. However, entry to the reactor is blocked with a 1 meter thick door, because the radiation level inside is still pretty high. It is precisely this place that many expired americium smoke alarms from Estonia will be brought to. After that, they will be placed in concrete cubes for storage. Besides, new radioactive waste delivered here for example from radiology hospital departments. The storage facility also contains old Soviet reactors, which up to this day emit sensible background radiation. For instance, when we were walking around the upper tire, of this hole, the radiation level would spike in certain places. Evidently, something nasty is stored underneath those places. Most probably, this was one part of the old reactor, because a book about contamination of this facility features interesting images of how solid nuclear waste was dealt with in the Soviet times. For instance, old steam generators along with rubbish and radioactive control rods were just thrown about in a regular warehouse. Nowadays the waste material is sorted and no longer poses a trade to those who are around unless they come too close to the radioactive cubes. In fact, this is a truly unusual place and I want to thank the Alara company for arranging the tour and demonstrating how old smoke alarms with emerism are stored. By the way, since recently, scientists have been considering using emerism 241 as a fuel for nuclear batteries, which can generate electricity using self-heating of emerism oxide blocks as a result of active alpha decay. Emerism oxide itself can significantly heat up and the obtained energy can then be converted into electricity. Such thermoelectric generators can be installed in future spacecraft, which will be able to last five times longer than the current spacecraft. For instance, the Perseverance Mars rover is equipped with a so-called plutonium nuclear battery, but its half-life is just 87 years. If equipped with an emerism battery, which has a half-life of 432 years, such a rover can work much longer. That is why maybe one day all smoke alarms from this nuclear waste storage facility will find new applications in spacecraft for space trips. 
Well, I think this video was interesting for you, and now you know more about that unusual element as a merism. So, if you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to know more about new and interesting things.